Good morning, everyone. Glad to see everybody here this morning. Want to welcome our visitors, of course. You always welcome anytime you're in the area and you can be here with us. But appreciate everybody being here for our Bible study this morning. We're in Revelation chapter 20. That's Revelation chapter 20. And uh, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 10 in just a second. But if you will, please pray with me as we get started this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you and praise you for this wonderful day you've given us, Father, another opportunity to gather together and study from your word, Father. We ask that you would reveal your word to us, help us to understand what you're trying to teach us and show us, Father. Help us to learn more about you and draw closer to our Lord and be more like our Lord every day, Father. We thank you again for all your blessings and we ask that you would heal and comfort and help those of our number who need it and we ask all these things father in jesus name amen so we're looking at revelation chapter 20 let me um i need to heal i kind of need to stop that powerpoint there for a second there we go. And here's our image that we're using currently right now where we've seen uh, Satan thrown into the lake of fire. So let's read Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and, that, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now in our workbook, uh, we're on question 10, and I apologize. We do have workbooks on the back table. Do you want me to grab you one? All right, so question 10, and this is, this is regarding where, the, um, where these folks, uh, the enemies of God and Christ, had surrounded the camp or the city. Um, what will happen before they succeed? Because, of course, they're after the saints, right? But what will happen before they succeed in whatever their plan might have been? Which, yes, man. Right. Nope. Right. It says fire from God comes out of heaven and will devour them. So, you know, they gather around the city uh, or the camp of the saints and appear threatening. You know, do we feel threatened like that in our lives sometimes? You know, sometimes we may feel like everything's against us, but, you know, God defends us and he removes these things, these obstacles from us before that they can harm us a lot of times. So that does not take away from the fact that sometimes we're going to have tribulation and troubles, but but God is with us even during those times. Um, but do you notice the swift wrath that they receive from God and if we look at Romans chapter 2, verse 5, it says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent, and impenitent just means unrepentant or, you know, not remorseful heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And they're treasuring up for themselves. They're storing up or building up this wrath by being disobedient and by not following the Lord. So, and then we see a contrast in Romans 11, verse 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. So it's kind of that warning of like, you can choose to be in the camp with the saints, or you can choose to be on the outside and be devoured by the fire, right? Yes. Yes. Right, it is that idea, you'll reap what you sow, and 
you know, we have that free will to choose to follow God or not. So that's, that's, that's how I see that. That's what that's in regards to as far as like how we can relate that to us right off. Does anybody have anything else on that? All right. So if we look at question 11, what will happen to the devil? Pretty simple here in verse 10. It says, yes, ma'am. Yeah, did you have something, Addy? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say for him. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, so, yeah, he will be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet have already been thrown into. We've seen that recently. Um, and notice that it says they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, who did Jesus say the lake of fire was made for? If we look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, then he will also say to those on the left hand, and you remember this is part of that parable of sheep and goats, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The lake of fire was not intended. It's not intended for us. It's not intended for any of us. But if we choose to follow Satan, that's, that's where we will end up. So that's a, definitely a strong thing to think about and be warned of. Um, we have another image here, if you'll pardon me for a moment. So we're going to move into, does anybody have anything else on that before we move into the next part of the verses here? All right. So Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 5. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now there's actually... This is kind of going quick, but I want you to see the picture here. This is this is just this artist's rendition again, you know, just an idea. This is like the throne. I have to kind of zoom in for you. Hopefully you can see it okay. That's the idea that they had and the way they pictured it. So just, just so we would know. And then here, oh, I hit the wrong one. That's the fat finger there. So... Then we have the books being opened, and of course, when they illustrated this, they did it as scrolls, which would have been probably appropriate for the time, if you think about it, before the print and press and all that stuff. So, you know, every time I always think of just a modern day book, but really back then, they had a lot of scrolls and parchments, that kind of thing. So, um, let's see. So these were the books opened. And then we got these verses here. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is the judgment. This is what we call the judgment um, oh, the lake of fire. Hold on a second. And here is the rendition of the lake of fire. Since we're using these pictures, we should try to, and, and I guess that's as good a rendition as any. That's pretty much a lake of fire. That looks like a ball with them. It's blown <laughs> from the glass factory. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did. Yeah, it just looks like, a. Uh, like it's just full of fire and lava to me, but yes, uh, however you see it is good. I understand. So, um, question 12, what does John see next? And I guess we have to back up, but, uh, I just, I took us through the pictures as we went through the verses. So, yes. Right. He sees a great white throne and him who sat on it. And then what about the earth and heaven? They fled away, right? They fled away. No place was found for them. I think at this point, 
I, I'm, I'm thinking that basically the judgment is occurring again, since this is a vision and this is spiritual, that this is in a spiritual place that this is happening. It's not really happening necessarily like on earth and that's earth and heaven is fled away. We're not there. Um, that's the way I think of it. I don't know that it much matters. That's just a thought. Who does sit on the white, the great white throne? Or who's sitting on the great white throne? Maybe that's the way to say it. Yes. God, but the ancient of days, Daniel 7. Is the right. Way to say that. Yeah, God or the ancient of days. We've, we've mentioned that before. And then who's our judge in the judgment? He tells us. Jesus, right? Yeah. The right hand of God, Jesus, yeah. So Jesus is our judge, right? If we look at John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So Jesus, and there's other places too, but that was just one reference where Jesus tells us he will judge, yes. Like his word or his will that the earth and earth and sky, I think it says, earth and heaven, earth oh. and sky, what? And we think about in Genesis how by his will, his word, God created it. And the immense power that in his word or in his thought makes these things happen, whether he creates, removes, whatever. Yeah, that's, in a way, that's a good way to think of that when the earth and heaven is fled away. It's like he's drawing, he's really drawing us somewhere else. When, when we're resurrected or brought to the judgment, we're being brought to the judgment wherever that is. So, and it's his, it's his power. And like you're saying, his word, like in Genesis, he spoke everything into being. And his will is for this to happen. Right, right. And we're actually, yeah, and we're going to see, well, we, we know that's coming up too. The, the earth and heaven will pass away. So, do anybody have anything else on that? Okay. So, then who does John see standing before the throne? Question 13. The dead, right? Both small and great. And I always want to say great and small. I don't know why the difference, in, but I always want to reverse that. But anyway, it just means everyone, right? Everyone is going to stand before the throne that, you know, for judgment. So what was opened? The books, right? Yeah, the books, the book of life. And the other book, what does the other book seem to be about or be have, have in it? Yes, ma'am. Counting of, of our life, and then the book of life is like whether or not we're, you know, going to be there. <laughs> right. But, the, but it's based on the data in the, our life. Right. It's like the book of life is whether or not we're in Christ, right? And then, but then the other book, the other book is like the book of our deeds or our actions, our our works, our faithful actions and obedience. So, because then, okay, so that kind of leads into our next question: How were the dead judged? In question 14, I'm sorry, did you have something? Well, I was just going to answer your question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, they were judged by their deeds and actions from their life. Right, so according life. to the works, yeah. In the verse where it talks about whether it's small or great. The dead are going to be, there, there's no partiality here. It doesn't matter that you were a governor or you were a peasant or whatever you were. You were a child in a family, whatever your status was on the earth, it doesn't matter. All will be judged, regardless of any of that. It doesn't matter anymore. And it'll be, it'll be equal. That's, that's a good point. That they mentioned the dead, both small and great. All, all these things that we think are important that makes one person better than another, or maybe you have more than someone else, or none of that's going to matter anymore, right? And, and there's not going to be any partiality shown with God. He's going to judge fairly with with his justice, and there's not going to be any of that partiality, whether you're poor or rich. Um, yes, Matt? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's a good point, that 
thinking about rich and poor, uh, Jesus had something to say in Luke twelve forty eight, where he said, uh, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, him they will ask the more. So there's a sense in which if we are blessed, even with physical blessings, there's kind of like an extra responsibility. There. Are we sharing those things? Or it could be right. Right. I've read that before and thought about that before. You know, to whom much is given, you know, much more is required. And we are we are greatly rich compared to a lot of the world if you think about material things. And so I, I feel like a lot more is required of us because of that, because of the way the, the I guess the easy way we've had it here in this nation a lot. So um, that's something to be aware of that while. God judges fairly, there is this sense that to those who are more given, you know, more will be required. So that is, that's an important thing to remember too. Let's see, um, did anybody have anything else on that? Because I was, I was looking at Psalm 62, uh, verse 12, also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work, you know, talking about judgment. And then there was the idea, will we all be judged? You know, because some people may think that maybe for some reason we won't be before the throne, we won't be judged. But uh, if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So even those in the first resurrection, which we read about earlier, which seem to be the resurrection resurrection of the saints, their righteousness will basically be judged or be affirmed here by the Lord. Yes? This is one of those topics that we kind of run into conflict with our uh, religious neighbors, you know. Right. They'll say, well, we're, we're saved by faith and not by works, and therefore it doesn't matter about your works. Well... We're, we're not saved by works of the law of Moses, but we're saved by faith, and part of our faith is to do these good works. Right. And that's what they're talking about. I think the confusion is, and I, I've been this this has been hitting me a lot lately. When we say works, people have a certain idea in their mind. You're working to earn something, right? That's the idea. But we're saved through faith and grace, which God gives to us. Freely, we just have to accept that. However, we are expected to live out in faithful obedience. And that's really what the works are. The works are us being faithfully obedient and doing and following what the Lord and what God has told us to do, right? So I think people get it in their mind that, oh, well, you can't be saved by works. But it's like, no, you're not saved by works, but you still have to have that action, faith requires action. If you say you believe and you don't do anything, uh, I think I've mentioned this before with like Noah. If Noah had just said, I'm, I'm not going to build the ark, would that faith have saved him? No, he, him and his family would have died with everyone else. So faith does require action. We have to do something. So, yes, I'm sorry. about Lazarus and the rich man and then we see uh, you know this this little glimpse that we get of you know the rich man being in torment and Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham kind of see that God writes those wrongs. Right. Well we see, yeah, now like uh you're referring to Matthew chapter twenty three verse twelve and and whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And, yeah, you can see that in that uh, parable of Lazarus and the rich man, or the poor man. You know, he basically, it sounds like he basically has a very miserable life, okay? We don't know a lot about him, but it doesn't sound good. And it sounds like the rich man basically is ignoring him, and yet he's right there at his gate, or right there, you know. And so the rich man ends up in, uh, I forget, what do they... Well, he ends up in torment, yes, whatever whatever that meant at that time, whatever that is for that, whether that, and then the poor man ends up in uh, Abraham's bosom, 
which is again sounds like a a much better good place, right? So, um, so there there is that contrast there, and so the, if the rich man, which they used to assume that rich people were blessed by God because they were doing well and doing correct, but that's not totally true. That's just a, a an over general the generalization or simplification of the old wisdom. Um, but um, obviously he was not doing the right things and not having the, the right works. Does anybody have anything else on that? I'm probably rambling too much, sorry. All right, all right. So um, if we look at question 15, who had given up the dead? There's a trifecta of people. Or things. Yes, the sea. The sea did. Death. death and Hades, right? So the sea, death, and Hades. Now, regardless of what everybody thinks, the Greek word Hades, Hades had levels to it. And Hades was like, you. they would think of it as really just the realm of the dead, right? Because it had levels to it, it had it had one section that was really a good section that you might think of as being um, heaven or a reward, but the rest of it was not good. So when they say Hades, sometimes that's not just the realm of the dead. Sometimes that refers to hell. That was their version of hell, even though they had that one section where it was good, um, which is kind of weird. But in the Greek, they didn't have another word for what we think of as hell. So, yes? The King James Version does translate as hell here, but that doesn't really make sense, right? Because you're going to cast hell into hell. Lake of fire is the idea of hell. <laughs> it's confusing, but it, then it makes me think of this, this parable with Lazarus and Abraham, I mean, Lazarus and the, the rich man. So maybe there was some other place, and I'm not going to say I don't know for sure, but it seems that it's possible. I guess I, the way I look at this, the sea and death and Hades are really parallels of the same thing. That they looked at the sea as like the realm of the dead, where that you know if you were a shipwreck or something that they considered that, and then of course death is, is death. Hades, the realm of the dead. So it's just like all of the dead. Christ defeated death, and he's thrown it away. Yeah, now that could very well be. That would that would that would be uh, good as well. Because later, because we're going to talk about the sea when there is no more a sea. Uh, the sea, you know, what's considered the abyss or a bad place for the dead, and yes, yeah, surely. But the other part of Hades be paradise. Yeah, the, there was one section that was considered like their version of heaven, and that would be, you know, if you, it again, this is Greek mythology though, but but one section of their realm of the dead was considered a good place. Did that been where but, Jesus and the thief went, but to the other part of Hades. Well, I don't know, maybe, because like we were talking about with Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus appeared to be in Abraham's bosom, which appeared to be a better place, maybe paradise, like Jesus was talking about. Maybe. Yes, ma'am. Even so, with all of that, those people are resurrected from the dead, from, from Hades. So they're not there anymore. Right. So now, Hades, minus all of those who have been resurrected to eternal life, this death thing is just thrown away. <laughs> right, and, and that's the idea. The combination of what y'all have said is like this, regardless of what these places are, they were they were all where the dead were. They're going to be emptied out. Everybody's going to be brought out to judgment, and then these places won't even be needed anymore, whatever they are, and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire, and they're going to be gone, and yes? And similar to what Matt's saying, you know, these three areas, three, death, Hades, however that works, these are all sort of the keepers of the dead. And when yeah. God's word and will, he's like, no, you don't have them anymore. They're coming to me. You right. no longer are the keepers of them. So whether they drown, whether uh, you know, they were killed and somebody threw them in the water or nobody got to bury them in the ground or whatever the situation was, right. whoever was the keeper of the dead, God calls for them to come back. Right, God brings all the dead to him for this judgment, and all these, whatever, 
that were where the dead were. And the sea is definitely related to like the abyss a lot of times, like like Matt was mentioning. Um, but he has the right to do that because he's the giver of life. He created us. He's yes. Right, he's calling everybody back to him for this judgment. And then and these things will not be needed anymore. Let's see. Um, so the idea here is no matter where they might be, where the dead might be, that everyone is going to be resurrected and come to this judgment. They're going to be there for the judgment. So does anybody have anything else on that before we move to the next question? All right. So question 16, what is the lake of fire called? It's very simple. They call it the second death, right? Right, they call it the second death. And if we look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. And this is kind of a reference to the fact that the, the second death, if you look in verse 10, the lake of fire, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is a, a place of eternal torment. And then who was cast into that? We really were just talking about them. Right. Death and Hades and anyone not written in the book of life, right? So all, all the enemies of God, all that oppose him, are done away with. Death is gone. Hell is gone. There's no realm for Satan or his followers. There's just that second death, the lake of fire. Yes? The, the second death kind of begs the question, what's, what's the first death? <laughs> I think that's just normal death, right? We all die in uh, Hades, the realm of the dead, right? But we're either raised to eternal life or we get the second death. Right. I've always assumed that the first death was just our normal fleshly death and that the, the second death is a more of a true spiritual death where we will always be separated from God. And this says eternal torment, and I'm not going to fight the Bible over that. So uh, that's not a good thing. That's not where we want anyone to be. Did you have something? Right. Well, to be in the Lamb's Book of Life, right, we we have to be baptized into Christ. So, well, I've always taken this new name. We we call ourselves Christians. We take on the name basically of the Lord. That's how I always say that. And the seal, the seal that we read about early in Revelation. I mean, that's really when we're baptized into Christ, we have the Spirit of God. We have the Holy Spirit, and that's our seal, letting, letting you know, and God knows his people because we have his Spirit. And that's that. That's kind of that seal. That's the way I look at those things. Now, that may not be the only opinion in the world, but I think that's pretty simple and straightforward with what the uh, Bible teaches us. Does anybody have anything on that or anything on chapter 20 before we move to the next chapter? All right. Let's see. we got a few minutes here. Now, chapter 21. In this chapter, we see all things will be made new. We have a description of the new Jerusalem, which is often what we think of as heaven, is this new Jerusalem. That's really... Most often when we talk about heaven or think of heaven, that's what we're thinking about. Now, sometimes we talk about God's throne room, which is described earlier in Revelation, and that's that's true. But a lot of times we're thinking of this new Jerusalem. And, and for good reason, because when we're there, we'll be there with the Lord. So if we look at the main points of this chapter in the first verses, all things are made new. That's verses 1 through 8. And then... In the next section, verses 9 through 21, we'll have that description of the new Jerusalem. And then in verses 22 to 27, we'll talk about, it'll have the glory of the holy city. Well, let me show you this 
We have an artist rendition here again. And we're getting close to the end of the book here, so just to. And this is their rendition. I'm going to blow this up some because these, this was their idea of the pearly gates. I'm not making fun of it. It's, it's what it is. It's, it's one idea of pearly gates, right? I've, I've never known what this should really look like. I don't have a good idea in my head. Yes, Matt. I remember when I first saw these images, I thought, well, that's weird. But it does say in the Bible, it's a, each gate was of a single pearl. So I know. I just kind of thought, like, you just, you know, I guess you see it in cartoons or whatever. It's like, yep. Well, it's these normal shaped gates, but with pearl embedded in them or something. Yep. And, and where is St. Peter? I'm <laughs> expecting somebody to be out here, right? That's all just, you know, that's silliness. But nonetheless, um, yeah, that's, but that's more how it's described than what I always thought of. Like Matt was saying, I always thought of these arched gates that would be made of pearl, but that's not really what we read. So uh, let's read the first eight verses of Revelation chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So if we look at our questions, question number two, what did John see? Right, a new heaven and a new earth. And let's see, okay, I won't get ahead of us. The next question, number three, what happened to the first heaven and first earth? Or previous, if you want to say that. Yes. Passed away. Right, they had passed away. Well, and that's what I was going to say. They had passed away. Now, which apostle speaks of the heavens and the earth passing away? And Matt, 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 and that's a, yeah, it's fine. Anyway, Matt already told us Peter, right? If we look at Second Peter chapter three verse ten, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So that was that was Peter telling us about that. Now, what of the sea? That was the second part of this question. You're shaking your head no. So no no sea. Bye bye. Okay. So yeah, the sea, which again we relate this to being like the abyss. So uh, what you know? Why is the sea no more? Because of what we were talking about earlier, right? There's we don't need that that abyss. We don't need that place. And and if you think about it, the seas in a way. They're kind of unfathom, unfathom, okay, I shouldn't say that, unfathomable, <laughs> and, then, and kind of a, a scary prison of lost souls and demons is kind of like representing that in a way. And then in a practical sense, they're a huge obstacle to us, and they're kind of a scary place of, you know, much death and disaster. And uh, it doesn't mean, however, though, in heaven that there would be no water. If we look at uh, chapter 22, verse 1, we'll, we'll see there, there is a pure river of water, of life. And uh, we also consider water, as in this case, like fresh water and good water, uh, to be life-giving and refreshing 
especially streams and rivers. So there's this contrast between the sea, and you think of that, the seas are salt water, which we really can't do a lot with. And then there's, and then there's this fresh water of life, and then there's that contrast, that difference there. Yes. Yeah, Jesus said he's the living water, right? Yes. Do you have anything? It, it seems like um, the Jewish people as a nation, they were never really a seafaring people. Oh, know? well, that's, so yeah. The Phoenicians brought, you know, stuff down, built the temple, and, you know, anything, anything like Jonah's out, you know, he gets, you know, he gets cast, cast into the sea. It's like the Jewish people's perspective is the sea's a dangerous place, place of death. The sea is, a, that, that makes sense. The Jewish perspective would be that the, Sea is a dangerous place and, and not a good thing, right? So that make, that does make sense, especially for, for them. So, um, I think we're, yeah, we're out of time for this morning. I want to thank you all for your, for your time and your attention. We'll pick up with question four next week. Thank you.